So tonight we're in the book of Numbers, and very much like last week when I was talking about um, the book of Leviticus and trying to make those things interesting, sometimes we think that they're not. There were some things today uh, that I read through, which I read through the, the whole, well, I didn't, I guess I wouldn't say I read through the entire book, but I, I skimmed a section and read through most of the book of uh, Numbers today. So you can sit and read through it and about, seriously, I'm not a fast reader, and I, I did it in maybe two hours, went through there and took notes and stuff as we're going through there. So you can read through the Bible if you can set aside some time to do that. But there were some things that came out uh, that I have always heard, and I thought, I wonder where that came from. Well, it came from the book of Numbers. I'm going to show you a couple of those things tonight. So there is value to all of these things. Like last week, one of the things I was trying to get us to understand was the meticulousness of God and the law and how he wanted things to be. And instead of being bored with the book, seeing the book as God is a God of great order. And, uh, there's, and we talked about that last week, about there's ways in which he wants things done, and um, maybe there's a lesson in there about not doing our own thing in our own way. And tonight, when we look at the book of Numbers, some of that is going to carry over. People kind of get bored with it because of all of the statistics and, and, and uh, the uh, census that take place in the book. And, and I get that. Don't get bogged down in all that. Just kind of read through some of those things and, and move on. Uh, there's still um, value to that. Just one thing, showing the size of the people in comparative in history, they're not this huge dominating force. And I think that's one of the things that Numbers helps to illustrate is that God uses them and God gives them victory over uh, overwhelming odds at times. Uh, and then he lets them be defeated when they have the upper hand in Numbers. And it just shows that it's not about uh, the might of the force. It's about the God that is behind the force and whether they are in step with God's, God's will or, or not. So, with that uh, said, let me just say a few things here as we talk about the book of Numbers receives its name from the Greek word arithmi or arithmoi, depending on the ending there, but that comes from a Latin translation of numeri from which we get the English word numbers. And we get this from the Greek even though we know the book is written in Hebrew because of the Septuagint. That's where we get the number from. The original uh, Hebrew, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, uh, uh, so I may be saying this wrong, but I think it's bare midbar. Uh, but what that really means is in the wilderness. And so it comes from the very first line of numbers there of them traveling in the wilderness. But we get numbers from the, the, uh, the Greek word that was titled on the Septuagint, which if you don't know, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was around by the time Jesus uh, was uh, around in his ministry. And so there's references that even that the, the uh, New Testament writers will be quoting from the Septuagint. And sometimes you'll see it um, represented in your Bible with a, a Roman numeric numbers as opposed to actually spelled out. If you ever see that sometimes in your footnotes, that's, that's referencing back to the, back to the Septuagint. And uh, very useful. It's because of the Septuagint that we, uh, I mentioned this I think in a couple of lessons earlier, um, because of the Septuagint helps us to understand the pronunciation of the Hebrew words. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, that the Hebrew language does, doesn't have vowels in there. Um, and when they were afraid that it just has consonants, there are vowel sounds in their words, but there are not vowel letters in the Hebrew uh, alphabet. And so when they, uh, we notice this after or during and after the Babylonian captivity, then we get what are called vowel markings in the Hebrew language. It seems that the, that the scholars and the priests in that, of that day uh, were afraid that they were going to lose the language because you know that when the when the when the, uh, Isra the Israelites were taken into captivity, one of the things they did was they said they taught them the Babylonian language. Uh, even Joseph, when he was taken down into Egypt, he was taught Egyptian language, and they tried to eradicate your old way of thinking in your old life and establish a new life with you when you're taken into these slavery type situations. And so they, uh, it seems to to be that that that's when that was established. So they put markings these 
these little vowel markings. And we have them like in English where we have like a, a, a straight line over a vowel. We know that's a, a long vowel sound or the, the short vowel sound and the schwa and all those different things. I think I remember some of that from, from elementary school. I don't speak it very well, but I remember some of it, you know. And uh, so that's what they had. They had vowel markings, you know, so they could know how to pronounce the words. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then in Greek, they have like lots of vowels in there. And so they always, <laughs> and I know I shared this with you, but I'll share it again for our whole internet audience of three. But um, we had, um, in my first, in the second church I was at in Kentucky, I was preaching and I was explaining how the uh, Greek language had all these vowel sounds. And I said, you know, like logos and theos, and then I said dumbos. And I was like, oh, that's, that's not good. But, uh, but the, <laughs> I, I still think it's funny because I got so red because there's, there's one lady in there. She's now gone on to be with the Lord. But when I said that, she said, oh, my. I mean, she was, she, she, she'd never heard a preacher make a mistake like that before. I was like, well, hold on, sister. I, sometimes bad Steve comes out. But, uh, but they have lots of vowel sounds in there. And because of those vowel sounds established in the Septuagint, helps us to know how to pronounce the, the Hebrew words and stuff like that. Which is why I said I don't argue with some who argue about the pronouncing, of the, pronouncing the, the name of God, where some say Jehovah. And that really comes from Septuagint and, and corruptions through there, that it's probably more Yahweh or, or something similar to that. And so that's why we say it. But still, uh, both of those are representative of, of the name of God, the name that God gave to himself uh, and told um, uh, Moses, this is what you'll, what you'll call me. So, uh, enough of, about some of that with the numbers there. Uh, the book is called, in number one, I don't know if I gave you this fill in here, but it's called the book of murmurs because of the constant complaining from the Israelites. The book is all, sometimes called the book of murmurs because they're always murmuring, they're always complaining. And uh, I was reading one uh, commentary today on, on this and it said, it's like the high-pitched annoying whine of a three-year-old kid that doesn't get their way. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, you know, and uh, we had uh, the mommies group was here today and, and, and they started getting, uh, the kids got kind of loud. I had to shut my door. Uh, it's good that it's here and stuff, but it was, it was loud to shut my door. But I could hear two kids were going at it. You know, they were upset. You were here with them today. I don't know who they were, but I could just hear that, that pitching. Just, nee, why am I not getting what I want? And it, that is the book of numbers to God. Okay. <laughs> that is the Israelite children to God. Here, number two, we want to write this. This is what takes place. There are two senses that take place in the book of Numbers, and there's no real change between the two. There's a census in the beginning, and there's a census at the end, which is interesting because there is uh, several plagues that God uh, visits upon the people because of their complaining. So as the nation is growing and multiplying, and God is kind of disciplining them uh, because of their complaining, there's really no significant growth between them. Once again, that will be important when they start to go into the promised land. And they go up against odds that are greater than theirs. And yet God gives them the victory. God, God is doing a lot of things with the Israelite nation through these first five books to establish who he is and their trust in him. And there's this constant, from the moment of God moving in the Israelite people, there is a constant we trust you, we don't trust you. We trust you, we don't trust you. Sort of like when the kids used to pick the fly. They love me, they love me not. They love me, they love me not. I think God, they're sitting there, it's like, we trust you, God, we don't trust you. We trust you, God, we don't trust you. Ah, we don't trust you. You know, and there's this constant going back and forth, it seems like, uh, to me anyway, in the books here. One of the other things that happens in the book of Numbers that we see is that God will lead the people by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire. It says what looked like fire during the night. And um, I was mentioning in uh, the Exodus um, study where we went through the tabernacle and talked about that the, the Holy of Holies was what they saw as the presence of God being with them. And so when they saw the cloud over the tent of meeting or the tabernacle uh, later on, the temple, then they knew the presence of God was there. And then at night there was a glowing. And it'll talk about uh, they did not move until God moved. 
So when the cloud moved or the pillar moved, they moved. If God was only at one location for a day, they stayed there for a day. And then if he moved, they packed up and they moved. And then it says whether it was a day, two weeks, or, or two years, they didn't move until God moved. In Numbers chapter 9, verse 15, the key verse on this is, On the day the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. And whenever the cloud lifted from the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. It's a neat, neat image here of just following God wherever he goes. Um, if you've had siblings... You might have had this experience, but I'm, I'm the youngest of my brothers, so wherever they went, I followed, you know, and uh, sort of like we say, uh, Mary had a little lamb, and wherever she went, the, the lambs were sure to go, or whatever, you know, that little kind of following around, sort of like that with God. God moves, then the, the nation of Israel moved, and then he'd move, and the nation of Israel moved, and then he'd move, and they, and they would just, they're just constantly wandering, you know, uh, around out there in the, uh, in the desert region, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, point number four, this is an interesting thing that happens in, uh, uh, in the book of Numbers, and that is that jealousy crept into the heart of Moses' brother Aaron and his sister Miriam. Jealousy, when I read this story, it reminds me that jealousy can get the best of any of us. Aaron is the mouthpiece for Moses, right? You know when he goes into Pharaoh uh, at the burning bush when God says, I'm going to send Aaron with you because Moses is, 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 is saying that he, he, he can't speak very well. And then God says, I will send Aaron with you. You know, so he tries to stall out there. And so Aaron is with him. So he has, he, he sees all these great things. And uh, Miriam, his sister, you think about the, the um, position that she had in rescuing Moses, you know, from the water. It was Miriam that was, sta that was stationed to watch the baby. And then she goes and fetches Moses' mother. And then, you know, and, and it's all worked out where Moses is, is cared for in those formal young years. And then goes into the household and becomes the son of the prince of Pharaoh. And um, so... Miriam is the one dancing too on the Red Sea, on the, on the shore of the sea there when the great victory is delivered by God. They have these great uh, positions, you might think. But they get, a little, they get a little upset. And they initially get upset because Moses has taken a Cushite wife. When uh, I think it, it, Zipporah, his wife, passes, then Moses takes a, a Cushite wife, which... Uh, She's probably a dark-skinned individual from Cush, that's, you know, a region of, of nor North Africa. And uh, so they're kind of complaining, and we don't know exactly why they're complaining, but it, it, if they just don't like that he's taken her. And so um, Moses then... Uh, they come and they complain, and Miriam then is, struck and, is stricken with uh, leprosy there. And it's almost as if... She's saying, I don't like that you've taken this wife of, of a dark skin. It needs to be maybe more fair or, or tan or brown or something, more like us. And then it's almost like God's saying, okay, you want lighter skin? I'll give you light skin. I'll give you white light skin. White with leprosy. And then it's like, so then they, Aaron and Moses, they plead for Miriam's life and for all of that and she is set outside the camp for seven days and then restored back and after she came back I'm sure she buttoned it up you know and didn't call out there so in Numbers chapter 12 verse 1 it says that Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife for he had married a Cushite has the Lord spoken only through Moses they asked hasn't he also spoken through us and the Lord heard this it's kind of an interesting way. <laughs> and the Lord heard this. So when you talk bad about me in my sermon on Sunday, <laughs> the Lord hears you, okay? You know? <laughs> that goes this way too. You know, I talk about the church. If I'm not nice about it, the Lord hears. The Lord hears and knows all things, does he not? He knew what was going on there. So that was an interesting story. Let's move on to chapter five then here to kind of just keep an overview of numbers. We could spend a lot of time on these things, but we want to keep an overview of the Bible, just putting everything together. The next thing is the 12 spies are sent into the land of Canaan to scout out the territory and to bring back a report. 
So as they're in the wilderness here, they've, they've, Moses has received the law of God from the mountain. They're, they're thinking, they're getting ready to move different areas. So they go to scout out uh, the land through there. And you know what it's like. You've, you've, if you've read any of the Bible stories, you know what happens, how they come back. And the land is indeed, that's why they call it flowing with milk and honey. It's, it's a way of saying this land has um, just everything that we want everything that we need. And not only what we want and what we need, but it is in abundance. And they talk about cutting down these two clusters of grapes that have to be carried back on a beam, you know. And uh, I've been to a couple um, uh, vineyards, you know, and seen where, how they're growing the, the grapes and stuff like that for uh, wine and different things like that. And some vineyards I've seen when the, the years haven't been so great and the vines are kind of sickly looking and, and that kind of stuff. And even in the best of years, I don't know that the bundles of grapes would have had to been carried on a beam, but this was that kind of land. And so they go through, they have a representative of each tribe, and you can read there in the book of Numbers, and it says who those rep representatives are. But when they come back and they give the report to the people, they talk about how the land is great, but then they talk about how the people in the land are like giants, uh, descendants of Anak, and uh, so that we're afraid of them, and the cities are fortified, and there's no way we can go in and take the land. So yes, it's good, it's wonderful, it's great, but there's no way we can take it, except two guys. And the one guy I love, it's Caleb. And we're going to see about Caleb later in the book of Joshua because like at 85 years old, this guy's like Rocky who's like, I will take them on. I mean, he is just this fighter. And so Caleb and Joshua come back and Caleb stands up and he and Joshua in support with him says, no, we should take the land God is with us. I mean, Caleb is the guy you want in your foxhole when you're in a fight. You know what I'm saying? Because this guy's like, if there's people all around you, he'd be like, we don't even have to aim. They're all around us, you know. It's no, he's the kind of guy, he's the kind of guy that you want in there. And so uh, they come back and they bring back positive reports. So in Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, key verse here, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and he said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. I mean, this guy, he knows God's on his side. And it says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. And they said, the land that we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. So what they did was they lied because their faith was so small. And I don't even know if it was their faith was so small or their dedication was so very little but whatever it was, they were not willing to do what it took to go into the land that God had already said, that's going to be your land. That's going to be your land. I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of lessons we could say in there and preach about in that with us that when, when God has promised us something, how many times we would come back and say, oh, we can't do that. God's called us to do something and we know God's called us to do something, but then we go, there's no way we can achieve that. I know that that's one of my issues sometimes. I look at where our talents and skills lie within our human abilities, and then I set my goals based on those human abilities, my abilities, people who are around me, and I say, we can achieve that maybe plus 10%. But God says, why not go 90%, 100%? You can do this, but I can do this. And then sometimes we come back and we go, well, there's no way we can do that. There's no way we can achieve that. Sometimes when we do that, then we don't see it. I had one person say, you know, if you want a God-sized miracle, you've got to have God-sized faith. You've got to step out with God-sized problems, with God-sized faith, or you'll never see the God-sized miracle. We want the God-sized miracle, but we don't want to uh, exercise the God-sized faith that it takes to do some of that stuff. So I'm sure there's a continuing lesson in there. So as punishment for their lack of faith, point number six is this, then God decreed that every man 20 years old and older would die in the wilderness and not enter into the promised land. So here's like of a military age. He's saying these guys 20 years old and older, you're, you're not going to get in there. You're not going to get into the promised land. And we know as we read through here that the only two guys from this generation, this wilderness generation, who do make it to the promised land is Caleb and Joshua. Joshua. 
In fact, it's Caleb who takes the toughest part of the battle. And we'll talk about that in the book of Joshua. He's a, he, I mean, in his older age, he says, man, give me Hebron. That's where I'll go. And he goes and he fights it. I'm telling you, this is the guy. That's a, everybody needs a Caleb in their eldership, man. He'd be like, I'll take them all on. You know, there won't be anyone in the church when I'm done. I'll get, you know, get them all thrown out, whatever. That guy that's just, oh, he just wants to take the battle in there. So they were cursed to wander then in the wilderness for 40 years, one year for each of the days that they had explored the land. The Israelites decided against Moses' advice, and they try to enter the land anyway, and then they're defeated by the Amalekites, the Canaanites, and they're driven back. Now, isn't that the way of things? <laughs> We don't trust God, then God renders judgment, and we say, well, we don't like that judgment, I'm going to do it anyway, and then God has to say, oh, really? Tell me your plans, you know? Oh, that's not going to happen. And they, they do that. And so in Numbers verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 44, it says, nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up towards the high hill country, though neither Moses nor the ark of the Lord's covenant moved from the camp. Now, you got to know that's bad. When the ark, when Moses, the, the, the number one guy talking to God, doesn't go out, you got to know it's not going to go good, you know. And when the ark, which was the presence of God on the move, that was their demonstration because that was the mercy seat. That's where God, that's where God hovered over the ark of the covenant and the holy of holies. When the ark didn't go out, they, they still thought, it's okay. We, we, you know, they got too big for their britches here, so to speak. It says, then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah. Beat them down. It was like a WWF throwdown cage match here. It did not look good for the Israelites and they're driven back. Now, let's talk a little bit about Moses' downfall. This is so interesting to me of all that Moses has done. And when you find out what it is that Moses did that causes him not to uh, be able to be uh, a part of seeing the promised land is interesting to me. But the Israelites are encamped at Kadesh. And the people began to complain again, which is a very common kind of phrase in the book of Numbers, that they complained again. They complained again. They complained again. And they were complaining about there being no water. Now, you know, if you've been in a desert kind of situation, water's everything and be, being able to find water. So I can understand why they need water, but God has been providing for them. So Moses was told to speak. This is the key here, folks. Moses was told to speak to the rock and water would come forth from it. But in Moses' frustration, and I understand, because he's like, how are you guys not getting this, you know? And um, in his frustration, Moses strikes the rock, and Moses says, we, do we have to bring water? The problem was, there wasn't a we. Even as great as Moses was, there was a he, and there was Moses. But Moses got a little too big for his britches, and in his frustration, I would say, because I do think that Moses had a healthy respect of who God was, because the Bible says there was no one ever as humble as Moses was. It says it in the book of Numbers. Of course, Moses writes the book of Numbers, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so I guess it's good to say there's no one as humble as I was, and I wrote that statement. But... Uh, but we know that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? The, even the Old Testament is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So I think Moses was humble, but Moses' anger and his frustration got the best of him, and he said a statement. He just simply said a statement, and he struck the rock when he should have spoke to the rock, which would have given complete glory to God. But the fact that he said we, and the fact that he struck the rock, showed that it was Moses who was involved in, in bringing forth uh, this water here. So in Numbers chapter uh, 20, um, I, I'm gonna, let me just read for you a, a section. I, I know I put just one little passage here in chapter 10, or verse 10 rather, but let me read to you 9. So Moses took off the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded. This is what God had commanded him to do. And he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm and he struck the rock twice with the staff. Ding, ding. And water gushed out in the community and their livestock drank. So good thing, right? Water's flowing. They're happy. They're excited. But verse 12 says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. 
Notice what he said. You did not trust in me enough to honor me as what? As holy. Now, I mentioned, I guess it was last week, or I can't even remember now, but holy is that attribute of God, the only attribute of God spoken of in triplica in the Bible. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And that word holy is set apart. God is set apart, set apart, set apart. And when Moses then is saying, must we, God is not set apart anymore. God is grouped now with someone. And, and that's what God is saying here. saying, in your anger, you grouped us together. And Moses, we are not together. Sometimes I have, I've, I've had to tell my, my children, um, I'm not your buddy, you know. Um, I, I'm not your peer. I'm not, yo, yo, Joe, home on the block with you. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I am dad, and I make authoritative rules here. So we are not buddies. We are not pals. Now, we can have fun together, but we're not, we, we're not in the same league. You know what I'm saying? Not yet anyway. Now, there'll be a time when they'll grow and mature, and we can move into that mature relationship where it's two adults talking. But right, right now, it's, it ain't that way, you know? And, and, and have to keep repeating that sometimes through these teenage years. And I think that that's sort of God saying, we're not, we're not pals, we're not buddies. I am your God, and you are my servant, Moses. And Moses in his anger lost that. And I think that we have to be cautious of that in our anger then, not to say foolish things that might have a greater repercussion on down the line. You ever said something angry in a meeting? You ever walked out of a meeting mad? I ain't coming back. I quit. The mayor of Cape Coral did that? <laughs> well, it's now going to be on the internet, so the mayor of Cape Coral did that. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't see that. But I, but I, <laughs> but I, I was in, I was in a, an, an elders meeting uh, at a different church, and some guys got upset, and they walked out. I quit. They walked out. And then, like, two, three days later, they, they came back, and they're like, you know, oh, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> I am not that kind of guy I would have been like, which I was. Uh, no, you quit, you quit on something like that. Um, when I left the church where I did leave, I told them I was done, and they said, you know, come back. I, I even told them, I said, no, if I got to the point where I said I'm done, I'm done. I wasn't going to do it anymore. And, uh, but it, it's okay when you know you're absolutely ready to make those decisions. But when you're not, man, don't let your anger get the best of you. And it has done that to me. I'm sure it's done that to some of you where you say, I'm done. And you really hadn't thought that through. And that happens to Moses in this thing where his anger gets the best of him. And he makes that statement of we. And he lessens the, the holiness of God, the separateness of God, and combines him with himself. And God says, I'm sorry, you're not going to see the promised land. Now, this is the guy who... <laughs> you know, the, the 10 plagues, let my people go, and all those wonderful things. But this kept him out. So let me just say, even one single sin, let me just preach for a second here, even one single sin will keep you out of the promised land of God. Even one single sin. Doesn't matter how many church services you've gone to, doesn't, how many, doesn't matter how many Sunday school classes you've taught, if there's sin in your life, that one single sin will keep you out of the promised land of God. It's got to be dealt with. It's got to be dealt with. All right, let's look down here at point number eight. The people complained again about the miserable food, you know. Now, God is providing them manna in there, and they don't like that. And so they speak out against Moses about him bringing them out into the area of the wilderness. And we had so much better back in Egypt and all that kind of stuff. And God has had enough of this. And so then he sends this plague of venomous serpents. Now, I do not like reading this part of the Bible because I don't like snakes. I don't like them. And, uh, but he put this plague of venomous serpents or venomous snakes that came upon them. But then, those who were bitten, Moses was told, because he intercedes, God, you know, I know they're, they're terrible. I know they're driving you nuts, but Lord, please, you know. Moses is constantly interceding on behalf of the people because he, he, 
he feels sorry for them, I guess. They're, they're like he is. They're, they're human beings, and he knows, he knows the goodness of God, but he also knows the, just the, the ignorance sometimes of man and how easy it is for us to complain. So he intercedes on their behalf, and God tells him about making this bronze snake. So he makes this bronze snake. He puts it on a pole. He says, raise this up. And anyone who's bit by a venomous snake, when they see the, if they look to this snake that you've made, this bronze snake, snake up on a pole, they will live. And then that then becomes a foreshadowing later, and Jesus will use this. He'll say, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man, when he be lifted up, will save us as well, draw all men to him. And so the idea where there was, there was uh, salvation in, the, in the, the object that was lifted up on the pole, obviously Jesus is lifted up on the cross. And though we have this plague of sin, because of our own actions on us, there is uh, a redemption there. And so just kind of a neat uh, way in which the Holy Spirit of God is tying in uh, these things that are going on. Verse, uh, chapter, uh, point nine then is this. Uh, the Moabites, the next thing we read about, and there's several things that happen in, in here with people, but we settle on the Moabites were terrified at the success that God was giving to the Israelites in battle as they approached the River Jordan. So as they're moving to the River Jordan, they're having success here. The Moabites, the Moabites then are terrified. And we're going to read about them when we get to the book of Ruth, the uh, Moabites, right, the, 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 uh, within that story there. So as that's going on, so then we have this, this neat story here about a donkey, right, that talks. So Balak, who's the king of Moab, he tries to entice Balaam, who is a uh, native uh, diviner, a guy in um, uh, sorcery and that kind of thing, and, and you know, having special powers kind of idea. He asks him to intercede. He wants him to place a curse on the Israelites. So the king's like, I'm going to pay you great wealth to do this. And so he says, well, I got to listen to God. And then God speaks to him, and God tells him, hey, don't do this. And then some people were sent to, uh, to him and try to entice him. He eventually goes with them the next day. And as he's going, he's riding his donkey. And his, what he doesn't see, but his donkey does see, is the angel with a flaming sword ahead of him. And if he were to keep going, that angel would strike him down and kill him. And so the donkey then says, I'm not doing that, and goes off to the side. And Balaam gets all upset and beats him with his rod. You don't donkey get out of there. And so the donkey, okay, just beat me. And so he gets there, the angel's still in front. I'm not going to that. And he smashes him up against the wall and smashes his leg. And Balaam gets upset. He beating the dumb donkey. And he's gone. And gets back on that donkey. And, go, and the donkey and the donkey just sits down. <laughs> and at this point, <laughs> the dumb donkey talks. <laughs> and speaks, right? And then Balaam's eyes are opened and he sees the angel that was ahead of him where he would have been killed. And so eventually, instead of cursing them, then he brings a blessing to Israel. Now, I've heard it said, so I'm just repeating, it's not a miracle for a donkey to talk. I've seen that happen in politics all the time. So I just, I mean, I just, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. So that's on the tape, man. We're not even gonna we're not even gonna edit any of this stuff out. So it's kind of scary because I'll be like, oh why I know years from now I'm gonna look back on that and be like, why did you tell that joke? That Theos and Logos and if there was a dumbass, it was not, it was the guy telling the joke. Anyway. As the book, someone got it, right? As the book of number 10, number 10, as the book of Numbers closes, Moses commanded that six towns be given to the Levites as cities of refuge. Now, this is interesting. I want to camp on here a little bit. These are towns that were safe havens for someone who had killed a person to flee to so that they would be protected until a fair trial could be held. There are so many neat things in the... Old Testament law that brought order to civilization. Now, I know that in our very liberal free world today, we look back on these things and we think, oh man, it's so chauvinistic and women are so oppressed. And I would agree with you that there is uh, some oppressive things still 
with women uh, in regards there. But that oppression very much changes in the New Testament when Paul starts uh, uh, teaching and Jesus is teaching that he's come to die for all. And Paul talked about there's no difference between male, female. Gen- you know, we are all have value and stuff with God, but we do have positions that God has established. And, and, and uh, Paul talks about that. Husbands are to be husbands. Wives are to be wives. Wives are not to be husbands. Husbands are not to be wives. It ain't two husbands and two wives. It's none of these things or whatever you want to call a modern family. So we do have our roles in which we play there, but the value in which we have for one another is, um, is equal in the eyes of God. Jesus died just as much for women as he died for men, and just as much for Jews as he died for Gentiles, because he died for anyone who would come under the saving grace of Christ. So, but with that being said, there are things that are done in the Old Testament law that are very much bringing protection on women more so than any of their other ancient cultures. You look at how bad they can. Well, this is one of the reasons why God doesn't want them to intermarry with the Canaanites. The Canaanite activities and the Canaanite women, I mean, we think Vegas is immoral. The, the Canaanite tribes are immoral. I mean, it's like Vegas and San Francisco and New York all, all wound up together. You know, uh, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, there was just a lot throughout those things, uh, you know, and it wasn't just as women. I mean, they would, they would, they'd burn male virgins at the stake for, for, for fertility of the land and these Canaanite things and stuff like that. So, I mean, need some good tomatoes? <laughs> Find us a male virgin, burn him at the stake out of here. We'll have great tomatoes this year. That was their kind of, that was their kind of thinking. And so, um, a lot of stuff to be said about that. But with that to be said, there are things that were put in the place where God tries to establish a rule of law. And one of the things is this, and that is these cities of refuge. So there's three to the north and three uh, general in the south region. So if you were to kill somebody, and you do this, you murder somebody. You're angry with them, forethought, you're mad, you take them out. You, Charlie's angel, bang, 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 you take them out, you know. Uh, then life for life. You take someone's life, you, you forfeit your life. But you're out there and you're just throwing rocks over this cliff because you're clearing off your land and some dodo dumb guy comes walking underneath the cliff where you're throwing rocks and doesn't have enough sense to look up that there are stones falling and not walk underneath there. And you did a bam, he gets nailed on the head and he's gone. Most of us would say, well, if you're that dumb, I'm sorry. But still, a life has been lost. The thing that that guy needs to do who threw the rock over is he needs to flee to a city of refuge because when, when the blood avenger, when the second cousin comes around and he sees his brother Daryl who just got hit by a rock, then his brother Daryl and his cousin Daryl, they're all going to get mad and they're going to want to, you know, go after him with double barrel. You know what I'm saying? Daryl and Daryl going after bubble barrels for this guy. And so, so the guy who threw the rock then, he's going to go to the city of refuge. And when he goes to the city of refuge, he's safe inside the city walls so that a trial then can now be held. And when a trial is now held, they can factor out everything. Did, were you mad at dumb Daryl on the other side of there and you waited for him to come by and you said, you know, I'm going to throw this big rock on his head and kill him. And you'd be like, no, I was clearing my field. I've been doing this for the last three days. I can't help it that he didn't bother to look up because he had earbuds and he was beep bopping, mute, whatever it was. <laughs> and he gets smacked in the head by this boulder. Then the people are going to go, well, I'm sorry, but Daryl was dumb. And that's just what happens when you're dumb. And the guy gets to go, he, he, he now uh, receives his life. Generally then what happens is now his life is given to him, but he has to live inside the city of refuge until the high priest dies. The sitting high priest then, when that sitting high priest dies, then, then the guy who has now been acquitted of, of, of murder charges uh, can now is free to leave that city. Now let me camp out on here for a moment and talk about why this is interesting, this thing that is set up here in these cities of refuge. Because when you get into the book of Hebrews and it starts talking about Jesus is our high priest, and there's a whole bunch of things that are said about him. He's the elder brother. He's the high priest with whom we can relate to because he's a man like we are. He's subject to, uh, he was subject to temptation like we were, yet without sin, and all these different things. But... We are kind of trapped where we've got some sinful things that have kind of locked us into a city of refuge, so to speak. And when the high priest finally dies is when freedom really comes to us. 
So they would have understood some of that thinking of like, I'm in this city of refuge, and the high, the high priest's life then is the payment for this life because life, there needs to be a payment for that life. Dumb as that guy was, there needs to be payment. Why? Because that life was made in the image of God. And therefore, that life has value. The high priest's life, his death then, is what covers the payment of this guy who was killed. Now this guy can go free. So it's sort of like his, his death is applied to this guy's debt even though it was an accident or whatever. We call that idea propitiation, where someone takes the payment that you owe. And then Jesus comes, right? And he becomes the high priest, our high priest, and he dies, and now we are set free. We're no longer in that bondage, no longer separated, no longer, no longer caged in. The, the verse here in Numbers in 35, verse 12 says, that they will be places of refuge from the avenger, the blood avenger, that's what that is. The blood avenger was the next closest kin of the person who was killed, and then that person, that's, that's who would take their life. So um, my brothers would be the blood avenger. What's your brother's name? I forgot. Chad. So let's say something happens to Todd and his brother Chad. His next guy, so if... if Todd and I got in a fight for some reason and I happen to get the upper hand and I take Todd's life in a moment of anger or frustration because he didn't throw down the right cards when we were playing euchre, whatever, <laughs> you know, it's usually the other way around, but in my story, I like it this way. Um, then Chad now comes and he avenges Todd's life and he's the one, when the trial's done, he's the one they say, here you go running through, take off his head, however they you throw the stone, whatever. He's the one who would take up for that. When you think about some of those things, I know it seems a little bit, a little bit morbid and all, but God had a way of, of writing things that were wrong. But we lock people away. I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a minute. We lock people away and we delay justice. And the Bible says justice delayed is no justice at all, by the way. You know, um, we, we, we do those kind of things. The family is removed from any of that. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, some th vengeance and going overboard, which is why God establishes the law. When you did a certain crime, th the punishments were, were regulated. If they stole, it was, you had to pay back a certain amount. You couldn't just take everything from them. If they stole your, your cow, you couldn't kill their kids. You know, you could, there, was, there was limits. There was, and that's why it starts to, but it does ratchet up to where it gets life for life. You take their life, then you're, you know. And so God, you know, God, God had a way of trying to keep the, the community civil. Um, and there's some principles, I think, of that that were brought over into our justice system. You know, having a fair trial, you don't just, go, we don't go by mob rule, although that has happened and we've had all the bad things happen. But um, some of those principles are, are held over. In the last couple of minutes here then, that's the basic book of, of numbers there. Um, a couple senses and things are taken off. But in the last couple of minutes here, let me tell you a few things that I read about it, that kind of struck me. I was like, oh, didn't know that's where that came from. Um, how many of you used to watch, if you're brave, you'll say it, uh, The Hour of Power with uh, Robert Schuller? You remember, you watch The Hour of Power, Crystal Cathedral out there and stuff. I, as a kid, I would watch him, and he would always have um, that benediction right at the end. And I've seen it uh, in other places. Uh, where was it now? I've heard other people say this, and I'm like, I wonder where that came from, because it sounds so neat. Here it is, right? It's in, it's in Numbers chapter 6. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now, this is what's interesting. That comes from, God said, this is a priestly blessing. This is what the priest then would say to the people. In verse 22 of chapter 6 of the book of Numbers, it said, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, now Aaron's the high priest, his sons are acting as priests, they're all from the tribe of Levi, all the Levites are the ones who surround the tent of meeting and, every, and they kept everyone else at a distance and any of the priests then would come from the tribe of Levi. Not that, not that every Levite was a priest, but priests all came from the tribe of Levi. So here he says, tell, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. This is how you are to bless the people. It probably wouldn't be a bad thing for the church to end in such a way to say, 
This is how you should bless a church. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face shine upon you, his church, and be gracious to you, his body. And the Lord, and the Lord turn his face towards you, his hands and feet, and may he give you the inheritance peace. Kind of a neat, a neat thing there. I never knew that came from the book of Numbers. And see, this is why it's important to read through the Bible because you skip over that and you hear those things and you think, I never knew where that came from. Another section that I highlighted in my text here was uh, I was thinking about the Sanhedrin. Now, I'm, I'm no biblical scholar. I'm just, just an average preacher trying to teach you the Bible. But there are some things that my mind starts to pick up on and I, I start to correlate Old Testament and New Testament. Like, I've heard that before. I've seen that before. Um, I was working on a, on a mower deck just this week for someone. They wanted me to weld something up. Oh, yeah, your, your, your mower deck there. And uh, uh, so, uh, and I told him, I said, I, I, I think I've welded this before, right? You know? And I was sure, right, because it broke the exact same way. And then I realized I had, except it wasn't his mower deck. It was mower deck of the church several years ago. It was the same John Deere. And I was like, it broke the same way, the same spot. I remember welding the same thing. And after I welded and fixed it, it got stolen by some, somebody in town. So... Yeah, I know, I know. Did this guy buy it? I, I welded it before. Come to think of it, it did look like it had some prior weld marks on there. Mmm, Chucky. <laughs> so anyway, you have some of those moments, right, where something comes to you and you're like, oh, I think I've heard that before. So let me just read this to you and see if anything comes to mind. This is in Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 and following. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. And he brought them together, 70 of the elders, and had them stand around the tent. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on, his, on, on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. Now what is happening here is Moses is... Um, it's just becoming a little overwhelming for him. And God says, okay, so this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of help put some stuff in here. Now, let me just ask you, what things come to mind from this passage and other passages and other things in the Bible? There are two things that come to mind to me. I just want to see if it resonates with any of you. Give me one of them. Okay, we kind of have the day of Pentecost idea where uh, 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 there's uh, part of the Spirit of God is taken from Moses and put on these people and they begin to prophesy. And we see in the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes down and the disciples, some of the Spirit of God is put on the disciples and they begin to prophesy. Okay, what else? What else might be significant here? Huh? Well... Yeah, we have that, but the number's a little bit different. But what else is significant about this number 70, these 70 elders here? Well, what, what, is, who, who, what the crowd that Jesus stands before, the Sanhedrin, how many made up the Sanhedrin? 70 elders in there. I'm wondering if the way they got that number was because that was this number here that God had called out. I don't know, I wouldn't die on that. But God says you pick out 70 and then we're going to use those guys to do something. Because uh, I don't know if that's why that's there. But it, I start to think about some of those things. I happen to believe that that, that probably is where some of that came from. And uh, like I said, I'm no Jewish historian or anything like that. Someone might have some other idea. But I can see them acting in such a way. How many do we figure to make this, this ruling council here? And they'll go back through there and say, well, God, God drew 70 to have Moses here. That seems like the number. So something interesting um, another passage here says, um, this is where Joshua's son of Mun had been Moses A. Um, there, were some, there were two elders, two elders in this group in this story who were prophesying who didn't show up to the meeting. And uh, Joshua's upset and he's like, tell them to stop. But this is what Moses said. Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Now this might cause you to think a little bit more, but what does that passage sound a little bit like? 
I'm going to help you. It's something that Paul says. I think it's in the book of Corinthians. Where Paul says, I wish that all would speak in tongues and do these things. And, and, but then he starts talking about, but some are given this and some are given that. And, and the, I, I mean, there's just, there's just some ways in which people talk that seem to, that seem to correlate to ways in which Moses is like, I, I, I'm not jealous. I'm not the only one. I, I wish, that, I wish that, that the Lord's people were, they would all be able to prophesy and do these things. All but, you know, and that was kind of Paul's heart. I wish everyone could do these different things. But God has called certain people to do certain things. So that was an interesting passage that I drew, uh, wrote some notes to. Got a couple minutes here. Um, here's something that's interesting. We talk about tithing principles and stuff. This is in Numbers chapter uh, 18. So the Levites, let me just tell you, it's not in your notes here, but you can write this down if you want to. But the Levites were not given an inheritance of land portion when the land's going to be divided up. The Levites are... Um, they have cities that are established and they survive on the, the offerings that are made. Parts of the offerings are, are given to God and they're for God. Other parts of the offering are collected and held and they are what feed the priest and, and keep the, the uh, activities of the temple uh, moving forward and that sort of stuff. But even though they were receiving tithes, parts of the tithes from the people, God was moving in their lives so that their sacrifice was proportionate to everybody else's sacrifice. And that is found in this chapter 18 of Numbers in uh, verses 20, latter part of 25. It says that Mo the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Levites and say to them, when you receive from the Israelites the tithe, I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of what that tithe is as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as a grain offering from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. So he's saying, when you receive a tithe from the people, from their grain offerings, from their threshing floor and their wine press, and now you separate it out, I will treat it the same as you giving a tenth as I did them giving a tenth from their wine presses. You're giving it from, even though you're not pressing out wine and threshing the grain, you are making the same type of sacrifice. And he says this, and this way you will also present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes that you receive from the Israelites. That is why we practice a tithing principle in this church with all the money that comes within this church. And that's why we practice tithing as a principle in my household and have always done that being in the church. I'm kind of like a Levite here. I make my living off of the funds that come, me, Derek, anyone who's on staff here, uh, we make our living, we are able to make a living because you guys give to the work of Lord, which uh, uh, it's not that you're paying us to do the work of Lord, you're paying that allows us to be a resident Bible teacher and do those things that, that most of us don't have time to do because we're working other jobs, so we're not able to prepare sermons and lessons and that sort of thing there. But that doesn't mean that I have the right not to sacrifice like you guys do. So that's why I give a tithe of everything I make. And then we do offerings from time to time on top of that, which is what we preach and teach you. You can't do that without, uh, with integrity if you're not doing it yourself. But on top of that, a good principle, I think, lifted from here is, is the church then tithing to the work of the Lord outside of us? So that's why we then tithe and we shifted, uh, I don't even know how many years ago now, six, seven years ago, we shifted in our missions focus where we had faith promise, uh, which was a way of receiving funds, uh, to we will just tithe right off of whatever we get, which makes it hard for our budget numbers, Ravi could tell you, because you don't know how much you're going to get. So we just said, whatever it is, we're going to... So our budget numbers are always kind of, kind of weird sometimes. And people go, well, I don't know how you get this, this uh, missions number. We're like, well, we, we, you know, we kind of estimate where we think it's going to be. But we, and this is why we did this. Because what I had found out in the churches that I had been here and in other places, let's say we had a $100,000 budget. And we budget $10,000 for missions in our budget. But that year, the church... God blesses us and we take in $150,000. We never made a, a, another 5%, you know what I'm saying, $5,000 into the missions budget. So I sort of felt like God was getting cheated out of things. And so I said, well, we have this principle that's in our own lives 
This principle that is established to the priest, which I reckon that that principle then can be applied to the preachers, pastors, to church leaders today, and a principle, if it's good for all those people, then it should be good for the greater work of God. And so then we made that shift, and we have been, and I think God has blessed us in that way. We've been able to uh, do missions work and those sorts of things, and the church is, is doing uh, great things financially, and we're, we're watching where we spend our money and those kind of things there. I just think it's that idea of honoring the Lord, and when, when it was asked about, this is where these principles come from. And people may not agree with you with what you're doing, but if you've got a book, chapter, and verse, let them argue with God on it. Read that passage for yourself and say, you figure out, is there a Bible principle that might say this, and are we in line with that? And uh, so I want you to understand that, once again, I'm just showing you, these are things in the book of Numbers that some people would go, oh, I'm not, I don't want to read the book of Numbers. There's too many numbers in there to read anyway. 